everybody, Dan Cavallari, Slow Guy on the Fast Ride, and I am in the garage today with the inimitable Ellen Noble. Ellen, Hello. I just hit my hand on your bike. <laughs> <laughs> you need to put a helmet on. Yeah, no, I know. Well, we got this nice Red Bull one here. I'll just toss that one on. We're very professional here in the garage. Uh, Alan, thanks for coming down. Thanks it's for awesome. Me. You're um, you're recovering from an injury right now, so sitting on a stool is probably not the best choice. No, right it's now. good. I get to kind of flaunt my newfound posture. Yeah, it's good. I get to sit very nice I the do. whole time. I feel kind of like a slouch right now. <laughs> you just need a back brace for a couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, get it. I, think I think I'll just deal with the bad posture. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, Ellen, for those of you who don't know, is a Red Bull athlete. She is currently uh, racing for Noble Racing, which is your own team that you created, and uh, comes over from from track. Uh, uh, and look at that, there's a track here. <laughs> there's Ellen's bike. Um, and Ellen's making the transition now from cyclocross more toward the mountain bike side. You've always been a mountain biker, but you're now taking that a little bit more seriously as your priority. Um, and so your first race probably did not go as planned. <laughs> Tell us what happened. No, it went perfectly to plan. That's exactly oh, okay. what I expected to happen. <laughs> um, yeah, I did my first race since the start of the pandemic. Well, actually, yeah. I didn't even race before. Like, I had not raced for a few months before the pandemic. Mm. So I was, like, almost two years out from my last mountain bike race. Oh, my gosh. Got a flat in the first event. But I, like, rallied and had an okay result. But, yeah. I mean, it's not what you wanted. And then right. second race... The next weekend, I got crashed at the start, and I fractured my spine. Oh, so, good start to the season. <laughs> it's a great start. Yeah, and yeah. I will have missed almost all of the races by the time mm. my back, or potentially all of, maybe at least most of the races by the time my back is healed. So, Yikes. Yeah. Yikes. <laughs> not, not what we wanted, but no. it's the journey. That's, that's kind of how it goes in racing. I mean, just the unexpected. And mm -hmm. What kind of a, a recovery are you looking at right now? Um, well, according to the doctor, it's 12 weeks mm -hmm. to fully heal a spine because mm -hmm. unlike an arm or a leg that you can like put in a sling or mm -hmm. in a wheelchair or yeah. anything like that, you use your spine for everything that you do, even sure. in a brace, even on bed rest. Mm -hmm. So it's like every time you move, yeah. you're using it. Right. Um, so unfortunately it takes about twice as long to heal. Mm -hmm. With that being said, it's only been four weeks and I already feel so much better that I, I feel like maybe I'm healing really fast sure. or... Sure we're going to do another x-ray in a couple weeks and see. Cool. So with, with everything that's been going on, um, talk to me about your, your relationship with the bike right now. I mean, it's hard after a tough start to a season and transition and, yeah. um, where are you with the bike? I mean, what's, what's your relationship? Is it a positive, healthy relationship right now? Or is it a struggle? Um, where are you at? I feel like I'm a pretty healthy relationship with the bike. The last couple of years have been tough in general. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like I actually have a pretty, healthy relationship with the bike more so than I have necessarily had in the past. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, I'm like really craving riding. Nice. And I think like that's the difference of having like a physical injury versus like any health problems yeah, is yeah. that like I'm emotionally in the same spot that I was two months ago, Yeah. but physically in a very different spot. Nice. And so I feel like that's like a really interesting perspective shift for mm -hmm. me is that like I see people riding by my house all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, I want to do that. Yeah. And I thought that once I got back on my bike outside that everything would change and I would immediately feel better. Yeah. But unfortunately, like what I'm really missing is like that carefree riding mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. I'm used to. Yeah. And right now, like it feels really good to be outside and I'm really grateful that I recovered fast enough to get outside when I did. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely not carefree. Like True. every time I see someone, I'm like, oh, are they going to step and hit me, am I going to fall over? Am yeah. I going to like get stuck in my pedal? Is like, am I going to get hit by a car? You know, yeah. I'm like so worried about re-injuring mm -hmm. my back that it feels really good, but it's definitely yeah. sort of a tease. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's sort of fragility about it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, like a nervousness. Yeah. Yeah. And so I guess, um, in that, uh, same vein, I mean, what's been useful for you for getting back in shape and getting mentally prepared for, for the recovery? Um, you know, cause you're, you're basically what, four weeks into this recovery. I mean, mm -hmm. what's that been like? What's, what's your mental state with that? I mean, how do you motivate yourself, especially with the weather we've been having, mm -hmm. which has been so weird for Colorado. It's yeah. like London here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you move from Tucson where it's perpetually sunny. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, how do you mentally prepare yourself for that kind of getting back on the bike, even when it's hard, even when it kind of hurts? Well, I guess the thing is, is like, the day after I found out about my back, because like there was a gap between when I crashed and when I actually went to the hospital, because I thought that I was just, I thought I had gotten a pedal to the back and uh -oh. I didn't realize that I had actually fractured anything. Yeah, yeah. 
So the day after I went to the, I went the day after I went to the hospital, I was on the phone with my manager and I'm like, I just feel like I have the worst luck. Yeah. Like, is this kind of a sign? Like, right. should I take this as, you know, kind of a sign from right, the universe right. that like, this isn't right. And he's like, this happens to people. And he's yeah. like, and you need to know, like, this is the moment that everyone quits. Yeah. So you have to decide like, do you want to quit? And I was thinking about it and I was like, if I quit right now, that means that me getting crashed out at a race mm -hmm. is the last race that I ever do. Right. And there's no way, <laughs> no matter how frustrating it is and no matter how like devastated I felt yeah. to have broken my back, I'm like, well, it's not my last race. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't mean that each day, like that there isn't a struggle or that like I'm always super motivated, but like the overarching feeling is I'm not willing to be done. Mm -hmm. So I just sort of have to keep <laughs> putting one foot in front of the other. And mm -hmm. yeah, and, and like like I said, each day can get kind of like a big bummer. Sure. I'm like, I don't really want to like, especially when I was riding the trainer. Yeah. Like, oh, I don't want to be on the trainer <laughs> right now. But you know, yeah. you just kind of keep moving It leads forward. to good things. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, that's hard. I mean, every day, the, the, the big picture tends to be an easier one to accept, whereas yeah. the, the incremental change is, is always harder. Yeah. yeah. And I think people expect that it's like, you know, if the big picture is motivation, that all the like incremental yeah. stuff is also, right. you know, raw motivation, right. rocky style montage. Yeah. And it's really like, oh, I put uh. off my ride until 4 p.m. <laughs> again. Yeah. I'm going to do it. And then you feel better after. Right, but it's right. like... Yeah. Yeah. It's... That's the difference between a pro and a not pro is I, at four o'clock, I'd be like, well, <laughs> guess I should eat a burrito, you know, and not right yeah. today. <laughs> um, I, I lost my notes. Hold on a second here. I, um, like I said, we're very pro here. Um, okay. So behind me is your cross bike yes. um, and which is gorgeous. And I keep lusting after it, by the way, it's just such a cool paint oh, job. I love this bike so much. Yeah. Um, but you're making a transition right now to more mountain bike racing ish kind of yeah. yeah i mean well this year i will continue to race cyclocross because mm -hmm. it's the season that i am planning towards because all the mountain bike stuff happened in sure. may really yeah um but in general yeah i do have mountain bike aspirations i was pursuing them in 2018 and then mm -hmm. in 2019 started having a lot of health problems that like really sure. derailed that mission um so i'm trying to pick up where i left off I will once again pick up where I left off at some point, <laughs> hopefully next year. Um, but yeah, I mean, my I still have Olympic dreams and I would love to actually make a run at it and yeah. not just a one season pursuit. Sure, sure. So I don't know exactly how cyclocross will fit in and I imagine it will change a little bit every year where there mm -hmm. are some years where it's easy to race a bunch of races, mm -hmm. some years where it makes more sense to just focus on a quality handful. Sure. It's really going to depend on how the World Cup circuit yeah. changes and yeah. all of that. Was that the motivating factor? Was the Olympics sort of what made you sort of hedge in that direction toward mountain bike again? Um, partially. I mean, the fact that it's an Olympic discipline is a big motivator for me, yeah. but it's not the only thing. I just really love mountain biking and yeah. it's where I got my start. Yeah. And I think racing like at the top level of the two disciplines, mm -hmm. I prefer sort of the culture of mountain biking over cyclocross just mm -hmm. because it's a really hard sport as an American. Yeah, for sure. Because everything that you're doing is in Belgium. And yeah. I think that that's been kind of a challenge that I've had to try to work through. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm just psych or mountain biking has always been the discipline that's eluded me. Mm. So it's like, I've never really had a chance to fully invest in it. And yeah. I think I'd like to, yeah. to do that. Is if, for those of you who don't know, uh, Ellen did grow up in Maine, which uh, is the land of the slippery route. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> bike handling skills are a must. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Um, and it just really quickly, and I don't want to dwell too much on it, but um, the uh, the health issues you ran into before the back, obviously, mm -hmm. was, was yeah. you had Hashimoto's, uh, and and that's a thyroid. It impacts your thyroid, correct? Yeah. What was what was the? Um, how did you know something was wrong? I guess. Yeah, um, it was. It became pretty obvious very quickly. Like mm -hmm. as a professional athlete, you are in tune mm -hmm. and like you know when you're right and you know when you're wrong yeah. and I started having this like really kind of weird change of heart around racing where mm -hmm. I was like I would have like I would have bled for a win yeah. and then literally like the next weekend all of a sudden I was like god I just I would love to get a flat and yeah. be done with this race <laughs> yeah. like I just want to like I want to be pulled I yeah. want to like go home mm -hmm. and I was like that's really weird that's and I felt me. like that yeah. and so then it was like the more I trained the worse I got the more I rested the less I improved. It was like nothing I really did helped. Sure. 
Um, and so, I mean, after like six months of trying everything and I still wasn't feeling better, I'm like, I know myself. I've, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've, it's been me yeah, <laughs> for, yeah. I guess it had been 23 years and I'm like, and I still right. don't feel right. And sure. so I started down this very, very long path of investigation and mm -hmm. I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. And it's very rare that you have just one. Yeah. So I've sort of been made aware of a lot of unofficially diagnosed other autoimmune issues, but mm. At the end of the day, it's all sort of you treat them all the same. Right, so right, right. yeah, uh, and that was that was sort of the bigger mountain to climb uh, as you were, you know, pursuing, you know, race wins and just being a professional athlete. Um, w when you find out something like that, I mean, is there is there an element of hope behind it too? Like just saying, at least now I know. Yes. I mean, did that affect your training? Did that affect your mindset for racing after that? I mean, after the diagnosis. It did. Like short term, I was all optimism yeah. because the doctor didn't really do a great job preparing me for what was to come. Sure. <laughs> and so I didn't really know a whole lot about autoimmune diseases. Yeah. I had no idea that it was like a chronic thing. I thought mm -hmm. that it was sort of a, I don't know what I thought it was, but I just didn't really give a lot of thought to it. Sure. So I was like, he said six to eight weeks back to normal. Right, it just right. feels like a break. You yeah. know, you're like, all right, I got this. No big deal. Yeah. And six to eight weeks later, I'm like, oh my God, I feel worse. Yeah. Like what's going yeah. on? And I just... I had no idea this yeah. like lifelong journey that I was about to embark on. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, it really, really changed mm -hmm. racing for me. It took yeah. all the momentum I had from 2018, which was like an amazing year for yeah, me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and really put a halt on it for 2019. Sure. And then 2020, we had the pandemic. Right. Yeah. Perfect timing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Perfect timing for everybody. Um, well, and, and speaking of that, I mean, hang on. <laughs> um, you know, you've, you've also had another big change, which was you started your own team. I did, uh, yeah. Noble Racing, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we'll talk about that in a second, but first I want to also get to the Noble Racing Mentorship Program, yeah. which I love. I absolutely love that you're doing this. Um, tell tell the, the fine folks what Noble Racing Mentorship Program is. Um, so for the years leading up to the pand pandemic, um, I ran a cyclocross camp, mm -hmm. call it the Quest. Yeah. Um, for junior and U23 women in first two years, it was cyclocross. And then the third year, it was just a training camp. Okay. And kind of my goal with it was to create the thing that I had always wanted when I was sure. 16 and 17, Yeah. which was like just a training camp to be able to meet other young women. Because even if I was like, even if the camp was technically co-ed, mm -hmm. it was very rarely like an even split of sure. men and women. So there's like, oh, there's one other young girl here. Yeah. Like, That's great. So I created this camp and then the pandemic put a stop to it. Right. And I was really devastated <laughs> because it was like the highlight of my year to yeah. have, you know, our second year we had like 22 athletes. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, it was huge and it was yeah. so amazing. So I wanted to create something that was almost pandemic proof that still allowed me to interact and mentor and impact like these young athletes sure. that may not be given that same attention mm -hmm. in their like regional team. Yeah, sure. Um, and so this was sort of inspired by a young woman who has attended my, who attended the third year of the quest. Mm -hmm. um, and she had sort of reached out to me. She was like, I just want to like learn from you. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, yeah. that's so amazing. <laughs> that's such a good idea. And I was like, what if we kind of expanded this? And like, you almost had these like satellite teammates yeah. where like you all get to know each other and then like, you know, I can mentor people. And then when you meet at races, you have a friend on the ground, no yeah. matter whether or not you've met in person. And sure. So it's kind of grown from there. And I'm hopefully by tomorrow about to select the final, uh, the final young women for the, cool. for the mentorship program. Nice. So yeah, I'm pretty so, excited. So stay tuned to find out who it is. <laughs> um, how many are you going to take on? Originally I was only going to select three. Okay. In addition to Claire, who's the sort of the original. prototypical athlete. Yeah. Um, and then, unfortunately, we got so many applications mm -hmm. and so many good ones. I mean, they're all good, so it's hard because you have to be like really, really sure. particular. Yeah. So I don't know exactly. I might have to modify the shape of the program a little bit and mm -hmm. either do like fewer mentorship calls or maybe mm -hmm. invite some people to like be a part of the group calls, but not be, I don't know how right. it's going to work. I still have to figure it out because there's so many good so, applications. I'm like, I don't want right. to turn anyone away, but yeah. I don't, I only have so much sure. time and money. <laughs> well, and I think that really indicates just how much interest there is and, and, yeah. and how underserved that audience is. Yes. Uh, have you thought at all about partnering with other athletes for this or has yeah. it been any interest? I haven't 
like spoken to anyone directly about doing it, but I feel like that's actually a really good idea. Yeah. And the thing like that's so inspiring is like I ask these questions on the application that obviously are kind of pointed. You know, yeah. you're like, what does community mean to you? Mm -hmm. What like why do you love riding a bike? And all of the answers are so heartfelt and they're like, community means everything to me because I'm the only girl in this town. I'm the only girl on this team yeah. and like I just want to be around other young women and mm -hmm. like they're all telling really similar stories and like sure. you said it really shows how underserved yeah yeah this side of the sport is yeah. so and it's interesting too because it's such an isolating time with mm -hmm. covid i mean i'm sure everybody out there has felt that isolation and that loneliness imagine how doubly hard that is on kids mm -hmm. and then kids in a niche sport mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like you are about as as isolated as you can possibly be and then of course you know uh women athletes again, deal with even uh, more almost isolation because, you know, up until now, there's really been no support network for them. Yeah. Uh, so this is a really neat program that's uh, worth supporting and, and I'm glad you're doing it. And, and hopefully you. uh, if you're an athlete and want to help, Ellen, hint, hint, you know, get in touch. <laughs> um, tell me a little bit about Noble Racing, uh, the other aspects of it. Now you're kind of freelancing. Hey, I'm freelancing too. Cool. <laughs> yeah, except most of my freelancing happens here right at my desk. I mean, most of my freelancing happens in my garage, yeah, so. Yeah. Probably, yeah. So. <laughs> it's very glamorous. Yeah, very, very, very much so. I don't get a fancy helmet for sitting at my desk though, so you, know, you got me there. Right. Um, tell me about the racing team and, and why you decided to embark on the sort of privateer approach. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's kind of crazy. Like last year technically was my first year on the privateer life, but mm -hmm. it didn't really garner any attention because sure. I announced it like three days before lockdown started. Yeah, it was a good time. Yeah. Hindsight, great <laughs> timing, all that. So for a lot of people, this was sort of the first year of the program. Yeah. And to be fair, this year I took it from a program and I really wanted it to be seen as a team. I wanted it to have a name. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to although it won't happen in the immediate future, someday, someday I'd like to be able to have teammates. And yeah. I just don't, I don't want it to just be, you know, like an individual collection of sponsors. I really mm -hmm. want it to have this sort of, um, you know, collaboration. Sure. And so, so far, I mean, it's been so amazing watching a lot of my partners like come together in mm -hmm. a lot of different ways and it's only just the beginning. Yeah. Um, but I think like the magic of being a privateer or starting your own team is that this sort of stuff really benefits riders who want to connect more personally Mm -hmm. with their sponsors sure. and I mean there's nothing wrong with the riders that just want to be on a team do their thing yeah. and leave but I've just I love meeting people connecting with them getting to chat with people and it was something I really wanted to be able to do with a lot of my sponsors mm -hmm. on previous teams but mm -hmm. I haven't always had the opportunity because it's better to have that buffer on yeah, a team because you sure. can't have every individual athlete on a, you know, 35 person road team right, or whatever right. reaching out to each sponsor. It's just right, crazy. So right. for me, I really like to be able to connect. And I think like as a rider who focuses a lot on like kind of off the race course stuff as well, there is like a demand and there is success for those riders yeah, yeah. to be able to kind of go out on their own. Mm -hmm. So who's, who's supporting you? I mean, obviously Red Bull and Trek. Yes. Who else, who else do you have on the docket? Um, oh my gosh, I'm always so afraid to like happen to forget someone, oh. but it's, it's, a, we'll make sure we list. mention them. Yeah. We, we'll make sure we'll do like an overdub. Them. Okay. Yeah, we'll, just be like, <laughs> we'll get Morgan um, Freeman to do an overdub <laughs> of Ellen's voice. So a new partner for this year is donkey label. They're my clothing sponsor cool. and they came on in a big way, which is really exciting. Nice. Um, obviously bond Traeger, in addition to Trek, mm -hmm. um, SRAM subsequently zip mm -hmm. and rock shocks. Cool. Um, Wahoo, nice. Scratch Labs, working with Alan Lamb. Right, so right. A, no <laughs> one was surprised by that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I have Kuat Racks, nice. Bike Racks, mm -hmm. and Pete and Jerry's Eggs, which oh, what? is amazing. That's awesome. <laughs> yes. um, oh my gosh, I know I'm forgetting someone, and I'm going to feel so offensive regardless of... Do pedals, anybody pedals? Oh yes, I'm working with Crank Brothers, See, I but I forgot to put them on because we'll, I switched we'll put a little out drawing. My, yeah. my favorite pair onto yeah. the bike I'm riding more often. Okay. Um, oh my God, I know I'm forgetting someone. I feel so terrible. We can We can list it in the liner notes too, just in case. Okay. Yeah, we'll get the full list. Thanks. Um, but you know, I, I, I put her on the spot. It's not fair. Yeah. So. Sorry, sponsors. No, I mean, humble brag, but it's hard when you have such a but long so list. So many people want to support me. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, well, that's cool. I mean, I think the privateer mode is is a, an approach a lot of athletes are starting to take, and it's it's daunting. And, and yeah. I think it's cool that it's come together for you. And and I do think that uh, that adds value having the mentorship prop. Uh, program. I mean, it just builds our community, and and that's so much what we need right now is an expansion of who is welcome in our community. Yes. So uh, uh, that's to me quite admirable. Um, well, what what else do we forget about Ellen Noble? Uh, what do the what do the people need to know? When it, when is your if you heal up in time? When's your next race? The only race that is realistic or is like potentially possible is going to be nationals. Okay. So nothing like not racing for a few not months and just hopping into the national yeah. championships, which is basically a World Cup and an Olympic year. No, um, big, deal. no big deal. No big deal. No big deal. <laughs> and then cross. Yeah, and then right <laughs> yeah into it's going to be a lot of training and not nice. a whole lot of racing again. Yeah. Well, tell the folks where they can find you on the social medias and websites, anything like that. Um, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. TikTok. If that's your speed. I don't um, even know what that is. It's it's fun, but it's a rabbit <laughs> hole that you don't need to go down. Yeah. Um, I'm on there at Ellen Likes Bikes. Okay. I have a YouTube channel. I think I'm YouTube slash Ellen Noble Cyclist. Okay. Um, and I have a website, ellennoble.com. Cool. So right on. That's the best place to reach me. <laughs> so reach out to Ellen, especially if you're a professional athlete who wants to help her. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Definitely that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks again for joining me. It's yeah, awesome that you came you so down much. here. Um, I, I, I live outside of Boulder, so it's actually quite an effort for people to leave the Boulder bubble. To leave the bubble. Yeah, so this is, this is admirable <laughs> that she made it down here. If you have questions for me, I'm <laughs> at Brown Tie Dan on the social medias. And please do sli sign up or even <laughs> sign up for uh, Slow Guy on the Fast Ride newsletter at slowguyonthefastride.com. And there'll be more videos like this uh, with wonderful people who are doing wonderful things in the bike world. Ellen, thanks again. Thank you so that much. That was fun. Thank you. All right. You guys.